that's not this. Okay. So it's the stereo. I should try and meet up with them while I'm there. 
So Mugwumpin has uh, has existed since 2004, and um, we create all of our work from scratch. We work through an um, ensemble devising process where we um, choose a theme or perhaps a person, um, something that catches our interest and really uh, piques our curiosity as the basis for creating our work. And, um, and then we just do a lot of research on that topic and come into the rehearsal room without a script, without a real notion of what precisely we're going to make and together just start um, bashing our heads and bodies together until <laughs> something play-like starts to emerge. Um, and so this year um, we have chosen as our topic American Prophecy, um, which from the beginning <laughs> Uh, sort of beg the questions, what do we mean by American and what do we mean by prophecy? And what are some of those approaches that we could take to those ideas? And very early on after we selected the theme, um, we happened to run across a book that, uh, that Greel wrote, which is, is um, Jeremiah uh, or uh, Isaiah, you know, said, you know, violated the covenant, you have broken all the promises you made to God. I mean, it has nothing to do with predicting the future. It has nothing to do with saying, you know, where, where I will lead you. Um, prophecy in America, again, going back to the Old Testament tradition, is about judgment. And in the Old Testament, it's God who will judge those who um, violate the promises that they've made to God. But in America, you have a situation where people, as you were just saying, have, have entered into a compact with each other, a compact that binds all the generations that follow. And that, um, that as one you know, uh, becomes, grows up, becomes a citizen, becomes aware of the country that he or she is part of, And so it's, it's a matter of promises people make to themselves uh, that they break among themselves. But there's no God who, who's going to judge them. There's no supreme by one as we show up on our appointed dates uh, wanting. Um, we have to judge ourselves either individually or um, or as a group, or as the name of a fictional group from a movie uh, that was really good. Um, you know, shouldn't have been, but it was. Um, I don't focus on, and I guess I'm not that interested in prophets. The, the key figures who I look at, and then it, you know, all sorts of people emerge from, from this, are John Winthrop, um, the founding governor of Massachusetts, Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King and Allen Ginsberg. And these are all people, it seemed to me, who are wrestling with this question of promises and judgment. And um, it might be how we as a people work out our own um, uh, damnation or forgiveness. Be there's no salvation, there's no end. Is a made up a country. It's symbolically made up, founded, over and over and over again. The, the founding of the Puritan community in 1630 in Massachusetts is legal and, and official and real, in a sense, with the Constitution in 1787, um, the nation is refounded again by, directly, if, it's, if America is to become a great nation, 
it's going to have to live up to the promises it made in, in its founding, equal justice under the law for all, uh, a chance for everyone to find out who he or she concrete evils are bad. We shouldn't have them. We should get rid of them. Well, it's just not that simple. Um, and, you know, uh, people think of New England as the hotbed of abolitionism in the 1840s and 1850s. It wasn't true at all. New England was, was as ferocious in its persecution of abolitionists as any part of the, of the country. It's bad as Kansas. Um, and I just, I just don't think that's a useful way of, of going about any discussion. Um, you know, like I said, I'm prejudiced against Cornell West, and so I, I see him saying that the role of prophecy is to, is to name concrete evils. It's saying, well, I will be the prophet, and I will name the evils. Um, Martin Luther King, when he, in, in the months before his address to the March on Washington, um, he was giving versions of the speech that he would later give uh, in Washington, D.C. in August, in Detroit, and in other places. And when you read them today, or listen to them, because you can hear recordings of them, they are, um, uh, they are, bombast and they are um, you know someone all becomes about him and he says I I I will drive through the mountain of despair and come out the other side the implication being you know and and maybe you like the children in the wake of the The whole I blasted through the mountain like John Henry, and and when he when he you know begins to bring those themes extemporaneously into his he disappears and he disappears, mm. and that becomes a speech that everybody listening, white, black, young, old. Um, people, you know, who weren't born then, can enter into as they, as that, ne that never changes. Um, you know, I've been reading a book um, called The Stammering Century. It was written by Gilbert Seldes, who uh, was a cultural critic. Um, 23, I think, called um, The Seven Lively Arts, and it really was the template for criticism of popular culture in America uh, from that time on down. He doesn't have any books with him. There are no DVDs. There's no internet. Um, he, he doesn't have any material to work with because he's going to write about Al Jolson, Sophie Tucker, Charles all of which are still part of the American cultural conversation. I mean, he, he, he hit the right marks. But he has nothing to work with except his memory. So he writes this book about Charlie Chaplin routines and Sophie Tucker's And it's all, you know, all in his head. So then he writes a book called The Stammering Century, um, which after the huge success of The Seven Lively Arts is completely ignored um, and disappears as if it's never been. And what it's about, it's a history of revivalism, religious cults, utopian communities, and radical reformers in the United States in, in the a promise that will ultimately expand to include all sorts of people um, who maybe it was never contemplated to include, but the, once the cat's out of the bag, there's nothing you can do about it. And that's what Martin Luther King is saying. 
Um, and Allen Ginsberg in the middle of the Vietnam War in, in 1966, traveling across Kansas in the very center of the country. He's, he's there, you know, giving poetry readings at colleges and universities. He's not, he's not making a heroic quest, except he is. That's what he turns it into in his great poem, Wichita Vortex Sutra, uh, which he's composing as he's riding in a Volkswagen van around Kansas and Nebraska, um, you know, pulling in stuff off the radio, whether it's songs or news reports. Uh, and he says, I come to Kansas. He, he is the only one of Lincoln, Winthrop, Winthrop, a religious figure. You know, it, it, it's a long, very poem with many different kinds of voices. And, you know, in, in different times, Ginsburg, when he performed it, it would, it would become a very, a very different kind of poem. Um, I once taught a class about, about this poem. Um, and in, in fact, I, I didn't exactly teach it. I turned it over to two of the students and said, you teach the class. Um, we'd reached a point in the course where students could, could pick up that ball and run with it. Um, and I invited, um, as it was a class at Princeton, I invited Bruce Springsteen to come. He had wanted to come to a class, and this was the only one that was going to work. So I said, okay, you, you know, got to read the poem, got to listen to this recording. <laughs> And uh, he came and um, but then immediately the mask of cool comes down and you know no one is going to ooh and ah. And Bruce came into the, this room with an argument he wanted to make about the meaning of the poem and the idea of prophecy. putting people at ease and drawing people out and not, uh, you know, he, he's the opposite of a blowhard. So he never said anything except in response to something someone else said. But the argument he came into, you know, when I, I come here lone man from the void uh, to Kansas to make prophecy, what that what that argument is about is that I come to you, to Kansas, I come to you as a Jewish, commie, queer, dope fiend to claim full citizenship, to claim that I have the right to speak this. The ambition to speak prophecy, to prophesize a prophecy about the United States or any, anything else, um, is 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 grandiose, but it's also modest. It's also saying this is this is what we as citizens uh, have to do. This is part of our obligation. Um, motives are always mixed and confused. Um, there are executioners and victims, um, and the lines aren't always as clear as they might be. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Cornel West, and, and I, I don't trust people who, whose mode is self-promotion, um, and I think I think that's a lot of what Cornell West is about. And so to say um, Matthews, but who renamed himself Matthias and um, proclaimed himself Jesus Christ and the king of the world and who ruled over um, what he called his kingdom, which was a single house in New York City with six disciples. Uh, and yet in this tiny little, you, you know, almost self Um, he he became uh, a, a national figure, a subject of incredible scandal. Um, his only legacy after the whole thing blew up, uh, he committed two murders, 
uh, like so many American religious cult leaders, he realized community belong to him. Um, it's something you see happening over and over again, not just with Joseph Smith or, or Brigham Young, but uh, David Koresh, Jim Jones. Um, fell apart once you know his, his victims died. The only one who never renounced him, the only one who never um, turned her back on him, even after he disappeared, which was a community that was completely communistic, um, that involved um, uh, uh, spiritual wives with polygamy, um, or rather all people held in common with everyone else. Um, and was enormously successful, I mean successful monetarily, in real American terms. <laughs> it made a huge amount of money um, and, um, and held together in, in, a, in a really astonishing way. And at one point, Saldis, after laying out all the spiritual principles that, that are binding these people together and that are guiding them um, towards salvation, he says, it's not that the doctrine is hard to understand because it makes absolute sense within its own frame of reference. What's hard to understand is that anybody believed it. And, but by this time, he is, he is so sucked you in that you're saying, yeah, right, okay. He, he just lulled you into this trance. Um, you know, when you start a country with the Declaration of Independence, and you put in there that it is not only your right, but your obligation to pursue happiness alone, together, there's no limit to what that could possibly mean. And then when you say in the preamble to the Constitution that the purpose is to form a more perfect union, you are going to have people, as long as that country lasts, saying, Yes, and I can create a more perfect union than the one everybody seems to think uh, is okay. And that's why I'm going here, we're going to start this community and we're going to create our own, our own nation symbolically um, that will um, save the world. And that's going to happen over and over again. And Seldes is telling the story of, of how a great tradition, a great deep, impulse, you know, collapses into degradation, self-parody, and corruption, and manipulation uh, over the course of a of hundred years. And he says, so I've told the story of failure after failure after failure, and, you know, m maybe all of this sh should just be forgotten. Maybe, maybe we should burn every, every manuscript I've quoted, um, and then he sort of ends the book by saying, but dot, dot, dot. And what he means is, I love all these people. Uh, I, wanted, I want to be there in every moment. Uh, I want to see this happening. And, you know, it becomes a very inspiring story. I mean, the Shakers, Mother Ann Lee coming over from Manchester, um, in, I guess, the 1770s or maybe 1780, um, bringing her, her, her little tribe uh, of heretics, people who, who are acting out a heresy, a Christian heresy that goes back to the 13th century, um, comes over to America. And what is this about? That there's sin in the world. And the only way, and yet we can all be not like Jesus Christ. We can all be Christ. It's possible for all of us to be free of sin. But the only way for us to be free of sin is to create a world in which there will be no more sin. And since human beings are by nature sinful, the only way to create this world and ensure the second coming of Jesus Christ 
is to create a world where there will be no more people. And thus, she creates a community of celibates who are going to spread and spread and spread until finally all people are part of it and no more children will be born in the world and then Jesus will return. You can't really come up with anything crazier than that. <laughs> you can't come up with a doctrine less likely to attract people and say, that sounds like a really good idea. And yet, it was enormously successful. Uh, in the 1820s, 1830s, even the 1840s, uh, there were Shaker communities all over the eastern part um, of the United States, and particularly in the South, they kept on growing. And there may even be half a dozen left people, five but communities um, <laughs> in the country. Yeah. Um, oh, community? There's one community in left Maine. in Maine, yeah. yeah, and there are five of them. Yeah, well, Although two people joined last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, uh, and I don't know. I mean, I I have <laughs> developed a little obsession with the, this kind of um, uh, how f fascinating the Shakers are, and in particular, the way that um, they were actually um, sort of spreading their message, and Mother Anne was um, traveling around New England and upstate New York converting people during the Revolutionary War. And that was sort of the context in which she was um, doing her work. And, um, and yet they were being constantly persecuted for, well, for a number of things um, within, uh, within that context. Um, and it just, uh, I don't know, it's something, I think it resonates for me um, with, uh, what you talk about in your book about the prom the promise, um, the betrayal of the promise of America being embedded in the promise somehow. Well, yeah, I mean, when you, when you found a nation on promises that are so vast that all people uh, should be free, that all people are free to pursue happiness as they define it, uh, that all are equal uh, under the law, um, but those promises are so great and so limitless that their betrayal is inevitable. Their active betrayal, their you could say even evil betrayal, or simply um, the failure of people to under to um, to to bring within themselves the notion of a compact between people uh, that those kinds of promises imply, and thus treat other people with the, with, uh, the respect and, and deference that they deserve, just to put it on the most personal level. Um, but it's, the, it's because those promises are so vast, and because they were expressed in language that is so beautiful, um, that they never lose their luster, and they never lose their, um, their glow. And so the betrayal of the promise becomes the engine for its fulfillment. Um, it's only when people say, no, this isn't what America's supposed to be. No, America promised me this, and, it, and it's all been taken from me my entire life. I believed in America, but America lied to me. That's you know, something that's being said from the, the 1780s to this very day, over and over in countless different languages. And, and, and what happens is people then say, I'm gonna make this country live up to its promises. I'm either gonna live, I'm gonna, I'm gonna act out this in my own life, I'm gonna work with other people, I'm going to uh, stand on the street and rant uh, I'm going to stand up at the pulpit of my own church um, or run for office and, and say these things. I'm going to publish a newspaper like William Lloyd Garrison, um, the great abolitionist editor, wh whatever it takes. And so that becomes 
it, it, it is the betrayal that becomes the engine of, of fulfillment. We look at the United States today, and it's very easy to see, uh, particularly in things like the Patriot Act and all the laws and legal doctrines that have you know, grown up around it or flowed from it, we, we can easily make an argument, I think it would be a false argument, but it's easy to make, that we are living in a time that is less free or more unfree than ever before in the history of, of this country. And that, you know, the, that a president can order uh, American citizens killed um, without, without trial, without anything. Uh, and you know, people are now debating, well, yeah, it, certainly it's OK in Yemen, but you know, what about Indiana? Um, you know, well, who knows, maybe. Uh, that, that uh, on the order of the president, any individual can be held indefinitely without charge forever. Um, those are big things. You know, th those are absolutes. So we can, we can make that argument that, that uh, not only has America betrayed its promises that it's a government of laws and, and laws that we all have to respect and we all understand what their meaning is, um, but that you know, given, given our situation today, that had to be a fraud from the beginning. But you can also look at the United States today and you can point to all the different kinds of people who in years past, whether it's 100 years past or 200 years past or 10 years past, um, did not have the legal rights that they have today, did not have the visibility in society that they have today um, did not have not only the opportunity but the expectation that there was no profession that was closed to them, no, um, in, no form of human endeavor that was closed to them, uh, where in the past uh, that, that prohibition would be, would be absolute. And you can go down the list. You can say women, black people, former slaves, the Irish, Jews, homosexuals, and thousands of groupings, stigmatized groupings, within that kind of list. And you're looking at a very different kind of country than would have been imaginable in 1800, in 1850, in 1900, in 1950, in 1970. And you can say this country has, you know, against all odds and with people giving up their lives and with battles resisted at every turn and, and no battle ever finished and no, no victory ever, ever finally won or lost. Um, that we are living in, in, a, in a country that has, uh, uh, has more fully kept its promises uh, and is more free today um, than it ever was before. I'm not saying that's true. That's an argument that you can make with, with real force. Um, so it's an, it's an open question, um, it seems to me. Well, the question, the question was, did the sanctions, I'm going to use your wording, the sanctions against freedom promulgated by or in the time of George W. Bush after the terrorist attacks in 2001, um, are they still operative? Uh, and yeah, they all are, just about all of them.
having those powers because it's of dubious birth or right. African American birth. No, I don't think so. I think it's simply because there is a black man in the White House, period. It, it doesn't have anything to do with his having more power than a black president would have had 10 years ago. I don't think. Um, I'm wondering if any members of the ensemble have any uh, questions that they want to <laughs> lob at Greel. I have certainly more that I can. Well, I'm just curious, I mean, because President Obama has been brought up, brought up just now, um, and the fact that the book was published before he was elected, um, and um, because you speak very pointedly about um, Lincoln's second inaugural address and the things that he says in that that are so, that nobody would say now uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, Basically, how are we ever going to make reparations for the the evil? I'll use that word. I mean, I'm completely paraphrasing, but uh, evil of slavery, and what, will we ever be able to do it? Um, and just, I don't know whether you would have any reflection on on the things that you speak about in the book, in light of now having an African American in the White House. Well, it's not just an African-American. It, it is an African-American in, in a way that we don't normally use the term. In other words, the son of an African father and um, an American mother. Uh, and his father was, you know, was never an American citizen. Um, so, you know, it, it, it takes on a new wrinkle, not that most people think about it that way, no reason why they necessarily should. But Barack Obama, as a as a as a senator and as a candidate, was a, you know prophecy is about eloquence. Prophecy is about language. Uh, prophecy is about how you put words together in a way that tell people something they already know, but in a way they never before even glimpsed. Uh, saying something that that in anybody else's hands, anybody else's words would, might seem obvious, might seem matter of fact, might seem unimportant, suddenly becomes uh, of transcendent importance and, and you desperately want to understand this concept, this argument, even just this phrase to, to its bottom. And that was something that Barack Obama did both um, at the Democratic Convention before uh, he ran for president and then in his speech when he was being attacked for his association with Jeremiah Wright in, in Chicago, um, you know, where he essentially invited the whole nation to a campfire talk about racism. And the whole nation sits around this campfire listening, really listening, uh, and actually hearing what's being said, because what's being said is, has, you, you know, it becomes a story that everybody not only is part of, but wants to be part of. And that storytelling aspect, um, that to me, you know, and I'm, I'm not alone, I haven't heard that um, since Obama became president. And, you know, that, that was true with Bill Clinton too. Um, he was much bigger in, in a, as a candidate in 1992 than he was as a president in 1993 or 94. Um, and it was only when the Republicans shut down the government, you know, that he could become Captain Ahab and, <laughs> and actually, you know, rise to, the, to a new occasion. Um, so, you know, Barack Obama had and probably has within him that prophetic strain, that ability to speak of things and to say, who are we? What is this about? Bill Clinton did that after the Oklahoma City bombings in 1995, when he went to Oklahoma City. And he gave this extraordinary um, address, 
where he um, he attacked and he said um, you know there's something wrong here and there's specific people who are doing the wrong uh, and we have let this country get away from us um, and and it, it was a frightening speech in a way that a, you know a prophetic address pretty much has to be um, you know it when Obama was elected on election night, um, when he gave his acceptance speech in, in Grant Park in, in Chicago, he managed to weave together quotes from or allusions to George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, Sam Cooke, um, in, a, in a way that, you know, I think some people said, my God, did he, did he just quote Sam Cooke? And other people were saying, that's so familiar. That reminds me of something. And he, he was, you know, taking people into a collective American memory. Um, and yet the country was, was no less racist the day after he was elected than it was the day before he was elected. That was not going to change. Maybe many people like me were naive in thinking that, you know, their reaction would not be so complete and total. You know, when the Supreme Court ruled in 1954 against school segregation, very, very quickly the South unified itself and declared a policy of massive resistance. We will resist this uh, in every way possible. Uh, you know, they, they didn't actually come out and say, and we will, you know, kill people and burn churches and drive people out of their houses, which, of course, um, they did, along with every kind of legal and illegal official act. Um, but I wasn't expecting that the Republican Party would immediately go back to massive resistance um, because, you know, not just a Democrat in the White House, but a black Democrat. Um, that's just too much, and um, and that's the that's the battle we're fighting. Not to say what side anybody should be on. I'm wondering. Um, you want to ask about the root max? Oh yes, I would love to talk about that. So, <laughs> um, the the root mechanicals, or uh, is that their full name, or is it just root max? They've been going by root max for quite a while. Yeah, they're a company in um, in Austin, Texas. Root mechanicals is a term that referred to street pe preachers in England in the 16th. Um, and 17th centuries, 17th century, people who, who would just be there on the street, um, you know, um, um, just spouting uh, dogma and doctrine to the point where people called them rude mechanicals because they were rude and obnoxious and they were like automatons, <laughs> just machines of a prophecy. So that's, um, that's what their name is about. And they create, uh, they create work in a very similar way um, to how we do, um, without necessarily a, um, a script, but through collaborative creation. And um, they, in 2000, did you say? Yeah. Um, created a show based on um, another one of Grail's books called Lipstick Traces. And the subtitle is The Secret History of America, is that it? No, the 20th century. The Secret History of the 20th Century. Um, Just a little modest. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, that, I mean, that just fascinated me because I've met with them before and talked about work before. And um, I would just would love to hear about what your process was like and working with them and how involved in the process you were. Yeah, um, I had nothing to do with it at all. <laughs> um, they, the Root Mechanicals at, in 2000 were a theater group that had been going a number of years, three or four, I guess. Um, and the principals in the company were Sean Sides and Lana Leslie 
and Kirk Lynn, who was the, the main writer. Um, and that was 12 years ago, and that company is still together, that nucleus and, and nucleus of other people too. Is, you know, they're still uh, part of that group. They have really founded their own community, and it has lasted. Um, you know, no one has gone off to um, other opportunities, you know, whether, God, I've really got to make some money and start teaching school, or maybe I should go back to graduate school, or I've got this offer from a company in Boston. None of that has happened. Um, these people are still working together, and they, one play, one person will be the director, and another an actor, and in the next play, their, their roles will be switched. There's a rotation of tasks that's just essential to, um, you know, bringing out the best in, in everybody. And one of the company, Kirk Lynn, I guess, uh, contacted my agent and said they wanted to do a theatrical adaptation um, of this 500-page book, which just seemed to me totally insane. <laughs> so I said, sure. Um, <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with this. I don't want to read the script. I don't want to approve anything. Uh, if you have a factual question, I'll answer it. But I don't want to. I don't want to discuss it. I don't want to talk about the true meaning of this or that. I just want to see what you make of it. And when I finally saw it, and it's this 500-page book boiled down to I think 70 minutes, um, they had staged the book I had wanted to write and failed to. It was just the most. It brings tears to my eyes to even talk about how, how gratifying it was. Uh, and how thrilling, um, you know, it, and, and that was really true. There was a spirit that I could never quite get into the book, and they did. So, um, I had nothing to do with it. I made no contribution at all. And one of the most remarkable things about it, it premiered in, in, um, in Austin, <coughs> And it played in Austin and then in Houston over, I guess, a two-year period. And then um, it went to New York for uh, six weeks. And I guess in 2002, and there was a New York actor named David Greenglass, um, Greengrass, who played Malcolm McLaren. And he was just uncanny as Malcolm McLaren and his unctuousness and his accent and his superiority and, and his sort of hidden gleefulness. It, it was really something. So um, the next morning after the premiere, I get a phone call and uh, my wife said, it's, it's, someone is saying he's Malcolm McLaren. <laughs> and so I took the phone and you know I'm talking to this person who's raving about what a great performance David Greengrass had given and you know it was just it was me and and I'm I'm I know it's David Greengrass calling up as a prank call to sort of praise himself no but it turned out it was Malcolm <laughs> and he wanted to mount a production uh, of this play in London where he would play himself <laughs> he was so inspired so that's that's how good these people these people are <laughs> Never happened, but it would have been nice. Um, in our last few minutes, I want to open it up to questions for any guests who are here as well, if you have any for real or for us about our process. Now, you know, you, you could probably tell if you ask me, you know, how many pennies it takes to make a nickel that I'll go on for 20 minutes. But, <laughs> you know, I, I can also answer briefly and talk about small things. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of have a small question. Can I, um, so when I read your email inviting me to this, I, I was thinking, well, and then there's a little sidebar, you know, would you contribute ideas? So I was thinking, well, what would I say? Some of the, one of the images of, of modernity that just always sticks in my mind is, is of a shorebird wading in a pond parking lot, and so it's doing what it instinctively knows how to do, which is wave, 
but it's in the wrong place. It's like in the gutter, or it's in the pond, it's on an asphalt. So, and then I'm thinking, putting that forward, a friend of mine who's, recent, who's a musician has uh, redone her website, and, and, um, and she's sending it to people, but they, most people have like little uh, iPhones, and with these small monitors, and, and she says they're not even paying any attention to the bulk of the website because it doesn't fit in the window. And, 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 and most people are not really reading email text because it takes too long to scroll through it. Um, so, so, I mean, the question, I guess, is, is, uh, is social media satisfying social instincts? I mean, in other words, this group seems very satisfying for a social animal. But when I write to friends on my Facebook, some communication goes across. But is the water too shallow? Are we really getting nourishment and sustenance from this kind of thing? I, I appreciate the benefits of it because I can like to see what somebody's doing in the Sahara, or at the same time I can check in with somebody in, you know, Iceland. So there's this kind of bringing together our disability to look around and see what lots of other people are doing. But, um, so I guess, it, so, and then since I'm on the stage, I was talking to an older friend of mine this morning, and, and because, because well, what are some of the antidotes, or what are some of the older ways of doing things? And she says, well, the quilting bee, people used to get together and quilt. And then it became like sewing bees, and all that sewing machines that get together and sew. And now she's a maid, a knitter. So she gets together like three or four times a week with seven or eight little ladies. And they have tea and they knit, and they sit around in a circle and they chat with each other about things. And so that's a kind of a working social uh, network. Uh, so so that, I guess that's all I wanted. What, do you have any idea like how, how to, um, I don't know where I'm going, I guess I'll go back to that image of a short period waiting in a puddle in the gutter. It's like, so, so the beach has been paved over. Um, our ability to, to seek nourishment out of our environment is substantially limited. Are we really going to get um, the nutrients we need to make healthy, psychic, healthful, psychological decisions? I mean, where, where do we get healthy nourishment in this environment? Well, I mean, that, that's a big question. I can't obviously answer it. But it's funny, when you, you know, told your template story uh, of the shorebird in a, in waiting in a puddle, um, you, can, you can see that as, as you characterize it, but you can also see it as the persistence of an impulse. Uh, that can't be denied, and that is um, incredibly inspiring. I mean, I spend a lot of time in, in Minnesota, and um, there are a lot of lakes in Minnesota. And when Minnesota says it has 10,000 lakes, some of them are about the size of this table. Um, and there are birds of all kinds um, in and around these lakes, and I, there, there is something that's not much more than a puddle. It's kind of like um, just a socket of water between um, a freeway off-ramp and, um, and, a, and a city street. And there are always geese in it. Always. And it's like, what are they doing in this, you know, godforsaken puddle when half a mile over there's a real big expansive lake? Well, they, this is their puddle. This is their lake. Um, and I think there is a human instinct to communicate and, and to, um, uh, 
to say forbidden things, say things you're afraid to say, because you desperately want to know how someone is going to react, and you, you hope and fear uh, of what that reaction will, will be. Uh, I don't think that is going to be um, denied. You know, when I was growing up, I was told, and when I got old enough to read more than, um, you know, Jack and Jill, I, I would constantly read that watching television as much as people my age were doing was going to actually change brain chemistry and was going to shrink the ability to apprehend broader realities than, than that which could be presented in a 25 minute sitcom and so on and so forth. And you know when I was about 21 or 22 and I would talk to people my age in college and we'd talk about TV shows that we watched when we were kids and I realized that there probably wasn't a show on in the 1950s, there were only a few channels that I didn't see because it never happened that someone would say, did you ever see such and such episode of whatever and say, no, I didn't see that. Say, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and my brain somehow, you know, had an atrophy. <laughs> um, I think it's very easy to overrate the present. Let's put it that way. Whatever the present might be. Uh, Grail, we, a, lot, a lot of our explorations in uh, our rehearsals have been regarding the ecstatic state and ecstasy and sort of a prophet or a prophecy's relationship with it. And um, that always hasn't presented itself in terms of language or words. And you, you referenced prophecy being related to eloquence and uh, something about making something specific or giving people a sense of something that sounds familiar to them. And it, it reminded me of a, of, a, of a definition I've heard for poetry, um, and I might not be pronouncing his name right, but it's uh, Irwa Sawadi said making the, poetry is making the unique universal. And they sounded very similar to me, and I just wondered if you could speak to the relationship of poetry and prophecy and how they're different than each other. Well, that's a really wonderful question. I, I mean, so often in the revivals in the 19th century, um, when the preacher or the prophet, and people so often presented themselves as, I am the prophet, when they preached, um, they sent their audiences into such frenzies um, that the descriptions, again from Gilbert Selda's book, the, the Stammering Century, um, are absolutely terrifying and hard to believe and yet you, you, you struggle to believe there's what people went through the, the kind of states of, of ecstasy transportation um, that people went through it, it, it's like watching the exorcist as, as something that thousands of in, instead of Linda Blair you've got thousands of people and this is the best event of their whole lives. Um, they don't need to be exercised. They're already, you know, they've already met Jesus. They've already become Jesus. That's what's going on. Um, and Norman O. Brown, um, who's a great philosopher, the 1950s and 60s, he wrote um, two important books, Love's Body, which is about the uh, I, I mean, Life Against Death, which is about the death instinct, and Love's Body, which is about um, the human instinct to express um, itself through, through poetry. And he argues, like so many people at the end of the 19th century, the symbolist poets argued, that the goal of poetry is silence. Uh, to reach a point where words are so perfectly balanced that um, they almost don't speak. Uh, they, they are like air. And language becomes something that we breathe and not something that we, that we ever speak. 
um, there is a strain of prophecy that obviously goes in the same direction. That's what speaking in tongues is about, uh, where you have to transcend language and you have to reach a point where what you were saying is absolutely untranslatable and yet completely clear to everyone who's listening. Um, and, and, you know, those are far mystic realms. Um, and I think, you know, for the project that, that you have, there, there is a tension, there's a conflict, there's a war going on between eloquence, the eloquence of, of Lincoln in his second inaugural address, which is, which is one of the great religious addresses in our history, um, and the urge to get beyond language. The only way to say the unsayable, to speak the unspeakable, is uh, either to, to reach a point where the only decent communication, the only communication that shows your respect for those you're speaking to and the respect you hope to get from them is to say nothing to appear and say nothing. Um, and yet, you know, that isn't something you just sh show up and I'm not talking to them. Um, it, is, it is a spiritual quest. Um, and I, I could see a wonderful scene where, you know, you, you have on the one hand somebody speaking, you know, with fabulous eloquence that you can't turn away from um, with, with such tremendous beckoning power and yet um, his audience or her audience dissolving into um, into a state beyond or even before language and, and in a certain sense ceasing to be human you know when you read the descriptions of what people did at revivals in Kentucky and um, and in Missouri and Tennessee in particular in the stammering century, um, you have, it, it's, you know, in some ways it's, it's very much like Bonnaroo. You've got like six <laughs> stages, you've got preachers on different <laughs> stages and people wandering around going from one preacher to another and reaching a point where, um, you know, not only are people coming forward and, you know, shouting that they're saved, that they believe, um, but, you, you know, it starts there, and then as the night goes on, um, people begin to bark like dogs. You see packs of people on all fours uh, running around and grabbing other people, people stripping off their clothes. You have orgies going on. There are people dancing, possessed by the spirit to the point, and Seldes is quoting this eyewitness account, and I just didn't believe it. I still don't believe it. Um, where uh, a man is is dancing and he's shaking his head around and he's pounding his hands into the dirt and he's doing, you know, he, he's flipping over on his back and finally he's whirling his head around with such strength that his neck cracks. And he snaps his own neck. You know, you read this. Here. And I just, well, put that on stage. <laughs> You've done <laughs> Come close. <laughs> so, so at the beginning you were talking about definitions of prophecy, what the words mean. So I guess part of this is a question to you to kind of go back to them because when I hear prophecy, and maybe it's from doing a lot of Latin in my <laughs> taking Latin class my youth, I think oracles and I think about the future pointing aspect of it. Um, a lot of the discussion we've had here has been about things that I would more think in terms of in a class of cults, you know, and, and with a prophetic aspect to the the rhetoric around it. But 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 I'm curious about and, and as such a lot of these things have to do with rules in the now for the followers of the prophets. Um, so I guess I'm curious, maybe one, zero, maybe, what what brought this theme 
uh, to mind, other than wh whether it was literally just reading the, the book or you're searching for it, two of those various strains of what prophecy can be. Yeah. Well, I mean, so the first part where it came from, really, I mean, we, you know, last year we sat down together and said, well, what, what are we going to um, create next year, 2012? And immediately everybody was like, apocalypse. <laughs> and, we, uh, and we talked about that briefly and it felt way too on the nose for us. Um, but it developed into like, well, you know, what is that about? And like, why does this um, sort of apocalyptic, aside from just the end, um, end of the Incan, Incan calendar, is it? Yeah. Mayan. Mayan. Mayan, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, but there seems to be a lot of rhetoric in the air right now about like we are hurtling towards a precipice of some kind and um, and it seems to uh, be particularly strong in America I mean you know there was Harold Camping in Oakland who was saying that the world was going to end with, you know a number of months ago and, right, yeah, and then know a number of months later right <laughs> Just a lot of people didn't notice right well, and then he had a stroke, and I no, sort I of... didn't notice that the world ended. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a kind of gestalt. Yeah, absolutely. Editor, you know. <laughs> he was anticipating his own world ending. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Like, he was, he says, he's saying the world is going to end, and in a way, it was just his own world that was coming to an end. And, and then he said really beautifully that, like, it's just going to be slower and quieter than I thought. And he also said, maybe I'm just not a very good prophet. It's a pretty... <laughs> um, but... I'm sorry, remind me, Michael, what the so, so, the so Well, so, so then, so to what extent is the future looking aspect of it? Yeah. Of interest, to what extent are the, is the potential doom or retribution? To what extent... Because, again, some of the things we've talked about today, at least, I think there's a lot more active function to focus on the now, even if there's a light shown towards the future of the prophet. It's now, because of that, now I own all the women. Well, it makes me think of, yeah, I mean, it makes me think of um, a, a book that you've referenced before that was inspiring for you is um, The American Jeremiah, which I've only looked at very briefly. Um, it's it's another earlier book what, in this from the seventies was it? Um, late seventies. Yeah, by yeah. Sack Van Berkovich. Yeah, Sack Van. It was one of the most interesting names <laughs> in all of American <laughs> history. Like His um, parents were very active in the fight to save Sacco and Vanzetti, and so they named him after Sacco and Vanzetti. Wow. Um, <laughs> like. Um, Sack man. Yeah. <laughs> but he says he quotes um, he quotes a, a um, an early um, I guess minister or preacher named Danforth saying that um, and I'm totally paraphrasing here and probably getting it somehow wrong that um, prophecy prophecy is just uh, history seen in reverse and history is just prophecy seen in reverse and. Um, there's a, um, there's a way that I think that we're um, feeling interested in, A, you know, in, in both sides of that lens. And, um, and to, we've talked a lot about how there seems to be a tendency in America through this um, constant self-reinvention that that means that there's a sort of sloughing off of history. And... Um, and that part of what prophecy has to say, perhaps, is a reminder of the history that's come before and then perhaps the consequences that we're living through now and that extend into the future. Um, that's one idea of an approach, uh, I think, that we're taking. But we're definitely interested in, um, in yeah, the present moment as the meeting of history and the future. And I, I think one thing that's interesting <coughs> is because it, it's been sort of leader focused, sort of these, these prophets. There, there's also this sort of thing where it is 
and, and it could still be leaders, I guess, but it's sort of the individual, pro a way for an individual to process something is to go into this ecstatic, prophetic sort of thing. Um, one thing you might want to check out is um, Kenneth Patchen's book, uh, The Journal of Albion Moonlight, which is a really interesting story, which is basically a journal, a fantastic journal that he kept during whatever the summer was, the summer that World War II was breaking out, or do you really you know that? I don't know the book. Yeah. So we're either talking about 39 or 41. Yeah, 41, I believe, yeah. And, well, it, it's, it's been too long since I've read the, the Brown. But, but it's interesting because he goes into this ecstatic spastic, and he's a big Blake guy. And uh, so he's channeling some prophetic and, you know, the things that are, I don't know, it's, it's um, but he kind of explodes outside the lines of what a normal novel are and the both, the kind of in every way. And it's, it's so it's, it's a similar kind of, of thing. It's not, and, and so it's less about successfully predicting anything necessarily. It's about seeing visions of what could happen based on current events, but it's ultimately maybe like the fellow predicting the world as well. Well, Donald the calls the one day. I, I haven't read the book you're talking about, but it sounds, you know, like it has great kinship with that, um, because it, it is, you know, it is, it is the most static, uh, the, the most ecstatic and horrific visions uh, that that are just appearing in the most prosaic and ordinary situations, and and that just loom up like like the monsters on the freeway. Um, it's tremendous stuff. Did you have a question? I, do. I actually um, wanted to ask you a follow up question to what you were saying earlier about the Mystic Traces uh, staging. Um, one, what was it that made you feel compelled that, that was, they had accomplished the book you had meant to write? Like, could you elaborate on that? Because, two, I was at the performance in New York several times, and every time I was there, we were really just completely ecstatic afterwards. And many friends of mine who were in successful bands started as a result. So it had this kind of full circle event of seeing the Sex Pistols in this. Right. And um, so there's this mise on a beam happening where the play does your book, explaining to the audience, see, life is theater, we're in a really like no duh way. And it happens, and this kind of magical thing happens. And, um, so I didn't know if you had seen Jesus of Montreal and if that resonates because your film knowledge is so copious. I don't know that. Now that so. Never mind, I'll just take point one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they, they, they had a, a spirit of, look, he, here I am trying to write this book about um, radical nihilist movements throughout the, the, the 20th century and, and going back to the Brethren of the Free Spirit in uh, in the Middle Ages and just all over the place and and I've done the research and I sort of have my fingers in in a dozen different pies and I have no idea how I'm gonna how this is gonna be a story um, what it's about and I sat down one day and I I wrote a play where. Um, where all the characters in the book appear in this um, in the same nightclub at the same time, and they're constantly fighting with each other over the stage, and you know somebody's leaping on the stage and pushing somebody off, and the other person fights their way back, and um, you know it wasn't very long, but it it got everything together, and it had a spirit of just don't give a damn. I'm not trying to make a point. I'm not trying to prove anything. I just want to make something happen. Um, and it doesn't have to have any meaning at all. And I was and and I was never able to get the spirit of that afternoon fully into the book. There are moments, um, but the book became something else. And uh, the people in in the Root Max read the book, and what they read, what they what spoke to them, were these. Um, filaments of anarchy and nihilism in in my own 
writing and arguments rather than the arguments themselves. And so that's what they drew on. And, and they said, well, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna tell this ridiculously complex and involved story taking place over all this time, well, we obviously have to do it simultaneously. And we have to have characters who not only never met each other, never heard of each other, but who lived in completely different eras and would, you know, one is dead before the other is born. Um, we're gonna have to show them sitting around at a table and talking. Uh, or, or getting into a screaming match. Uh, and how do we show what went on at the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich in 1916? You know, it's a lot of poetry readings, there's some dances, there's sort of little plays. Um, and, you know, they come up with something that, that, that is visually absolutely, you, you can't take your eyes off it, it's moving so fast, you have no idea what is going on. And you forget the fact that nothing like this would have ever happened in the Cabaret Voltaire. The idea is to think of the things that the Dadaists forgot to do uh, or didn't get around to, and that's just what they did. Um, and, 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 and there were, you know, there was nothing cheap. For example, um, what I mean by cheap, Phil Kaufman, um, had a movie on HBO recently called Hemingway and Gellhorn. It's about the relationship between Ernest Hemingway and the war correspondent Martha Gellhorn in the, mostly in the 30s. And I think, I think it's, it's an absolutely wonderful picture. But there's one moment where something in, in the Spanish Civil War, some soldier does something and the Hemingway character says, well, that's really grace under pressure. You know, just taking this famous Hemingway line and making it into dialogue, and it just, just sticks out like someone raised the red flag up the pole. It's so obvious and hokey. Um, and there was nothing in their play like that. There was no key to flatter the audience with something the audience would know. And say, yeah, we, we know that in reference. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to the book, you know, just something, nothing like that at all. It was just too fast. It was fast. Um, didn't you think? I, yeah, that's why I went to the I have a question that doesn't pertain to the subject matter, but does anyone know of an open class action lawsuit against Google for stealing all intellectual information since the Sanskrit text, putting it online for free? So. Uh, you can either read half my book for free with the Google app, or you can buy it. And guess what? People aren't buying it. it it's just so arrogant. I mean, it's like I saw the, the Sergey Brin on the Gravenution uh, show, and he just donated $145 million to some uh, safe scientific research, you know, and so this. For, to, to just take all intellectual information, put it online for free, without anyone's knowledge. I have looked at the website where my book is with Ex Libris uh, for like a year and a half. And I was so disgusted with the uh, digital van press nightmare. And then I find that 70 pages out of 235 pages of the novel are online for free. So sales were never, you know. <laughs> great to begin with, but Jesus, that's it. I mean, it's like, and so every work of intellectual property is online for free, and I don't see people riding in the streets. You know, it just absolutely infuriates me. And then I've talked to some people who tried to reason with me, yeah. saying, well, maybe if they read 70 pages of the 235 pages, they'd be prompted to buy it, but I don't think so. And this one class action suit at the Authors Guild in New York is closed. I pleaded with them for me to, to be included in that. But, I mean, this is just, you know, what? internet fraud, internet nightmare. You know, does anyone it have any inkling of um, I mean, I, I've, I've heard a lot of... Uh, grumbling or more than grumbling a lot of outrage about that and um, I mean it does make me think of something that we were talking about in rehearsal yesterday of like um, w 
you know, what is the thing that um, might push one personally so far that um, they make it a decision to go, to just go all in, basically, to really radicalize? Like, what is that? Sorry, I was expecting you to call. <laughs> um, what what is the what is the thing that's going to um, allow somebody to sort of go go all in to go past a sort of um, a point where they leap off that cliff where from um, I'm just going along in my comfort and in society and something is just one step too much and I have to um, I have to just face the fear of throwing myself uh, all the way. And I mean, I think that there are so many things right now that um, could inspire somebody to, uh, that could inspire somebody to riot in, in the streets. And that's, yeah, I mean, well, I, I understand. Do. And it's like, this is so, and I, I the, the only way to fight the behemoth of that nature is with a class action lawsuit. So, uh, I mean, I will file one myself because <laughs> uh, I'm such a frustrated old queen. <laughs> The, the publishing industry is so frustrating to begin with to get anything out there. But I mean, this this just absolutely blows me away, and and I did not get involved sooner because of my own just apathy. I, I never thought, well, look up your own book, you idiot. You know, why why bother? And then here it is, seventy pages. There it is, you know, cute little Google app thing to push a little button. And there's the whole thing, you know, at least half um, of, the, of, of the book online for free. That leads me to a question also. Let, yeah, no, but we, we do need to oh, make okay. this the last, the last question. But yeah. um, my question is this idea of prophecy and what the thing, you know, what, what are we asking of people and versus where we are today with democratization of information and social media and how what do you, how do you think that relates on how who we're looking to as prophets whereas we all have access to so much information right? yeah. you know uh, that's an unanswerable question people will always find ways to say things in a manner that seems revelatory and new and some of these people are going to be charlatans, uh, and some of these people are going to be possessed b by their own ecstasis, uh, and some of these people are just going to be trying to get something across, um, and we will respond um, in different ways. I, I mean, that will, I, I really believe that's that's a, a human instinct. It, it can't be. Um, can't be suppressed, um, but you know I, I'm always a mindless optimist when it comes to questions that large. But I am going to have to um, get back. Thank you all for um, being here, and thank you so much to Grill Marcus for being here. Thanks a lot. And okay. um, Grill has to go, but if anybody has any questions for us, we'll probably stick around.